Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so this is a, a very special occasion for me today because I'm going to share the stage with my lovely wife, uh, Judy. The Judy, the big lady there. <laughs> And uh, so first, before I begin, I want to acknowledge some uh, special guests that are here. We have a, a Pastor uh, Morris and his uh, wife. Uh, my wife and I used to attend the Southern Oklahoma Chinese Baptist Church. And i got to tell you, in 20 years, they look exactly the same. So Pastor Morris <laughs> and Pastor Morris. So my wife and, and I, our faith are, is very important to us. And Pastor Morris and his wife are, 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 been, are wonderful uh, spiritual leaders. And we have uh, our good friend of many years, uh, Sin May. Uh, and her husband is a very distinguished professor here at the University of Oklahoma. Next to her is her um, TV celebrity daughter, uh, Annie, uh, who uh, you may have seen on uh, TV. So uh, delight to see her here also. And Dr. Shifan Liu, who is uh, most recently our Vice President of Academic Services at the Oklahoma School of Science and Mathematics. So great privilege to have Dr. Liu here. He is a much more interesting speaker than me. So you got the wrong person today, Dr. Liu. Uh, is quite a daredevil. He climbs uh, mountains, and uh, he is, uh, in fact, uh, one time he was climbing a mountain, I think he was struck by lightning and fell 100 feet, and so has survived to, uh, has uh, many great adventure stories, true renaissance man, and also a uh, physicist, so delighted. And he'd be uh, doing some sharing, I think uh, we want to give some time for um, uh, sharing of uh, various people here, so I think, uh, uh, so that we can kind of, um, learn from each other's uh, experiences. I have a little bit to share, and I'm going to share a, little, uh, a talk uh, that I give that um, I've given to about um, 30,000 uh, teachers throughout the country. So I'm going to give a little piece of that uh, talk. And so I'm going to pull that up over here, and I'm going to compress it down a little bit. So I'm going to try to take maybe at most uh, 20 minutes. I have a, a few video clips to show also. And then I want to uh, uh, shared some time with my wife. Uh, she had me upload some pictures, and we were supposed to get here early for her to arrange the pictures in some sort of sequence. So they are actually out of sequence in my presentation. So um, I apologize for that. Or you know what we could probably do is after I speak, take a five minute break, and then uh, my wife can arrange the pictures in the in the slideshow. So just give me a second over here to pull this up. So I'm going to pull up. I have various little movie clips to show. And so hopefully it'll be a fun and uh, an interesting talk. They always tell you to enliven your talk with some um, uh, with some media here. So hold on a second. How do I get this thing into the into the slide mode here? Okay, I'm not used to the Mac version. So do I do a slideshow from the beginning? Oh here. Okay, great, great, great. So I mentioned uh, growing up as uh, American Chinese. Typically we say Chinese Americans, and I just want to. Uh, relate something that my father taught me when I was growing up. My father always told me, Frank, you are a American first and a Chinese second. I was born in this country in uh, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, when both my parents were graduate students at MIT, and they both came. Uh, they were originally from uh, mainland China. My uh, mother was from Shenyang, uh, all the way up in northern China. She, she actually said she grew up thinking she was Japanese because it was under the Japanese occupation. They didn't describe this occupation, of course. They, um, simply said that they were coming to reclaim uh, for the Mon people uh, in the, so she grew up thinking she was part of Manchukuo and uh, uh, Japanese, and then my father came from the very southern part of China in a, a little village then called Hojia, outside of, uh, of Guangzhou, about an hour and a half drive outside the city. And they um, all met in Taiwan. They met in Taiwan uh, as uh, students in a, a university in uh, Tainan called Tsengong uh, So they, um, and then they came to the United States in the 1950s. My mother said she came in 1958, so she uh, now will have been in the United States for 60 years, and my father came in uh, 1959. My mother was the first, I think, the first Chinese in her department in the MIT and city uh, planning uh, at the time. And so uh, I actually grew up uh, in a Chinese-speaking household um, early in my life, and so my name here, so thankfully I know how to write my name, is, is uh, uh, Wang Yo, uh, Hung, so it's Peng Yo De Yo, and Hung Xin De Hung, so it is, uh, has some nice uh, meaning, uh, nice uh, meaning to that, so. Um, but my father always taught me, he said, honor your culture and heritage, uh, but serve your country. So he was a very, very um, uh, emphatic, that, uh, that we uh, serve our country. My father was very uh, civically 
uh, oriented, and so that's why when I uh, uh, when I wear my jacket, I always wear the uh, uh, the American flag uh, on there. And so it, it's a little bit of a sensitive issue. I should mention I head up a school called Oklahoma School of Science and Math. We are about 30% uh, Asian. Uh, in the state of Oklahoma, uh, is only 1.8% Asian. So we are vastly uh, overrepresented uh, at uh, at the school. But I always tell the legislators that because uh, they can see clearly. I am uh, I, I, uh, 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 Asian. I tell them that you know my um, uh, fundamental belief is, uh, is serving and giving back. So I actually taught at the Oklahoma School of Science and Math for three years in 2003, uh, four, and five for free. I donated my time uh, uh, to the school. So I'm a very big believer in serving and giving back uh, to the community. So I'm I'm going to give a little bit of a talk from my uh, perspective, uh, which is a little bit different than maybe your typical um, uh, American Chinese. So, but uh, I was, uh, you might drop the lights a little bit in the front, so it's hard, that's easier to see if you can, uh, uh, and then you can keep the, let's see if you can, uh, uh, it's a little dark, uh, darker, so if someone could just turn down the lights in the front part, and maybe, uh, okay, great. Oh, great, wonderful. And so uh, this is, uh, uh, my parents could not afford uh, pictures in the studio, so they just took me to the laboratory and used the lab camera. So that's why the, you see the equipment in the background. So I'm not sure that probably was not a proper use of the MIT equi uh, equipment <laughs> at the time. But, um, and so uh, I was born in 1964. This is the day that, this is my, uh, one of my favorite pictures. Uh, my father received his Doctor of Science a degree in civil engineering at MIT, and I'm holding his, um, his diploma over here at the, uh, at the, uh, uh, at the time. Now, uh, my parents were uh, first generation immigrants to the country, and so uh, as uh, with other uh, immigrants to the country, they, they wanted uh, a, a, a better life for themselves and for their children, uh, but they were very disappointed now. Oh, let's see, okay. I, I meant to delete this slide, but I might as well tell you the joke then. Uh, so I'm a pure mathematician by training, pure mathematician by training, and the joke goes like this. There was uh, three uh, gentlemen taking a hot air balloon ride, three gentlemen taking a hot air balloon ride, enjoying themselves, uh, but not paying attention to where they were going. So one of the, um, after about 20 minutes, one of the gentlemen asked the other two, do you know where, where we are? And the other two said, we don't know. So they said, well, the, 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 the gentleman said, I have an idea. So he yells out as loudly as he could, hello, where are we? And um, no answer, some, some time passes. Finally, when they're about to give up, uh, in, the, in the distance, there was a very faint voice that responded, Hello, you're lost. <laughs> and uh, the gentleman asked the other two, he said, that man, he said, that man must be a pure mathematician. And the other two said, how do you know? And he says, for three reasons. One is, uh, he took a long time to answer, so the uh, uh, pure mathematicians take a long time to answer because they have to consider all the different uh, permutations and the possibilities and so forth. Uh, the second is when a pure mathematician answers your question, uh, they are always correct because they thought everything through. And number three, his answer is completely useless. And, and so that's kind of the tradition that I uh, that I come from. But uh, I didn't actually intend this joke to be in this uh, talk, because it doesn't really have anything to do with growing up Chinese America, though. But, um, well, this is the part that's, uh, that's really kind of central to my talk. When, when I was um, a youngster, uh, this is a, uh, um, a report from a neurologist that writes in yellow, it says, in review, I feel we're dealing with a child with um, neurological impairment based upon the history, delayed milestones, and minimal suggestive neurological signs. The top paragraph talks about my mother. It says, um, I explained to the mother what I felt about his delayed milestones as he walked at 16 months, could not sit up at eight months, uh, blah, blah, blah. And he says, after I told her all of this, um, uh, I don't think I got through to her at all. It says, uh, uh, she still feels he's not a problem, is progressing well, and schools have little difficulty to him, except he's a little behind. So the first paragraph talks about my mother. Uh, she tried to explain to my mother, the doctor tried to explain to my mother that, um, Something was not uh, right. Uh, the second, um, so it, so this is the key phrase in review. I feel we're dealing with a child with neurological impairment based on history, delayed milestones, and minimal suggestive neurological signs. 
Um, I still remember being brought to the medical clinic and they asked me to sit very still. They put a nose on my head. Uh, and I remember that because I, uh, it was very hard for me to sit still. But they said uh, because I was hooked to a machine, they, don't, they didn't have a wireless nose. Everything was hooked by wires. Uh, they put a lot of things on my head and they told me to sit still. Now this is the, oops, uh, this is the, um, the letter uh, to my uh, parents from the school. It says, uh, we have received uh, Dr. Setukati's neurological report. Uh, a copy of this report has been sent to uh, Dr. Schwibel, your physician. Of course, he will explain the medical seriousness of the findings in, in that examination. Would both of you please make an appointment with my office to discuss the educational implications of the report? So this is, uh, and, and this is dated uh, December 8, 1970. And my birthday was September 6, 1964. So at the time I was six years old, the teacher, my uh, teacher, told the school administration that um, she felt like she had a very severely learning disabled child in her class. The school then sent me to the neurologist. So it was not my parents. The school sent me to the neurologist and then sent a copy of the report to my doctor. So they called my parents into their office and the principal said to my parents, uh, we're very sorry to tell you, but your son has been diagnosed with a very a severe learning disability and his needs cannot be met in this school. They said that we don't have the resources to educate your child, that he is a better in a separate institution where they can take care of his needs. So the philosophy has changed over the years. Philosophy changed in the uh, maybe in the 19, uh, 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 50s, maybe 50, 60 years ago, the philosophy was if you had a child with disability, a physical or mental, it would be best to address their needs in a, a separate institution. Nowadays, the philosophy has completely changed. The feeling is, is even though someone may have a, a significant disability, we try to educate them together with the other uh, children, all in the mainstream. So that, but back then, it was they felt it was better to, to treat these children separately. So they told my parents, you need to send your child to a separate institution. And my parents uh, uh, were very upset. So they protested and said, no, 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 we insist that our child stay in school. And then my grandfather, uh, my wife has a picture of my, my grandfather on my mother's side. My maternal grandfather was educated in uh, World War II China. Uh, he actually went to a Japanese uh, medical school and learned his uh, just general, uh, general medicine in, um, um, uh, uh, in the, um, I think it was 1930s or so. My, my mother was born in uh, 1934, but he was educated in, um, in the Japanese medical school. He came and testified on my behalf. They had a big fight at the school board level, and he uh, was the only expert that uh, testified on my behalf. Everybody else said, there's no question that this child has a problem. And as you can see over here, because the, uh, it says very clearly, we have, uh, we're dealing with a child who has neurological impairment uh, based on history, delayed milestones, and minimal suggested neurological signs. So they had the scientific evidence because they put the notes on my head. This was not uh, just guessing. They just said that uh, when we uh, hooked up the child to the machine, to the monitors, it showed uh, very little brain activity. So my, uh, but my parents prevailed. My parents prevailed because my parents made such a big mistake. Sometimes with schools, they just said, all right, all right, you, you get to, we're letting you keep your kid in school. Well, so I was uh, socially promoted. Social promotion means that you get moved from one grade to the next with really no evidence you learned anything. Because, uh, uh, and, and actually, I'll tell you a funny story. I actually uh, didn't want to go to school. I was very, very scared of school. And I was very scared that a, um, that a teacher would ask me a question. Because I'm very shy too, and I didn't want to be asked a question. So I learned something. This, I figured out myself, if you turn on the oven uh, to a high temperature and you put your head against the oven, if I went to my mother and said, I don't feel well, my mom would put her hand on my forehead and said, oh, you are sick, you need to stay home today. So, um, so I did that a lot, and I pretended to be sick, so I missed a lot of school. So the truth is, I didn't learn anything in school, and I was socially promoted. No one, no one wanted to fail me, because then they would have to repeat. And um, so the, um, and the thing that's very interesting here, yeah. Yes, I'm going to get there. Yeah, I've got an important. I got an important. So the um, 
No, I'm getting to my important part. So, the, uh, uh, so I got social promoted, and then the, um, uh, now I, uh, hold on, now I forgot. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting disoriented now, but how is that possible when I'm oriental? No, okay, well, so no, 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 let's, uh, uh, no I really am disoriented. Because uh, my wife kind of threw me off here. Okay, no, don't say that. Okay. So, okay, I got social growth. So what happened was, when I got to uh, seventh grade, I noticed something very interesting. And I went to school, I should tell you, I did not go to school with a lot of Asian people. So my school was largely um, non-Asians uh, at the time. And uh, I noticed that in the school, in junior high school, if you were considered smart, you got to take algebra. They said, you are smart. We're, we hire a special teacher to take algebra. If you were considered um, average, you took algebra in, in um, ninth grade in high school. And if they considered you were hopeless, like they said, oh, this kid cannot learn math, they didn't try to teach you algebra. You just um, uh, took, you just learned how to write a checkbook, uh, sign, uh, balance a checkbook, and you took what they call general math, a consumer math. And so what I did was, I wanted, this is the part I can't explain, and so my wife is worried I'm going too long in my story, but the, uh, I went to school in New York State, and they give a test called the Regents Exam. The Regents Exam is a basic, no-nonsense exam, and they would publish all the old Regents Exams on a very cheap paper. This is like newspaper paper. And um, I thought, I want people to think I'm smart. I, I said, I'm tired of people thinking that I have no potential. I want to prove that I'm smart. So I got the old Regents Exam and started memorizing the answers. I didn't know what I was doing, because I didn't know really any math, but I memorized the um, answers to the Regents exam. So when I was in eighth grade, I walked up to the algebra teacher, and I said, Mr. Algebra teacher, I said, um, uh, I think I know algebra. And the teacher, to his credit, uh, said, all right. And he humored me. He sent me to the principal's office, and the principal has a little round table. And the principal says, well, why don't you sit down, and let's see how much algebra you know. So he took an old Regents exam from his desk. He looked at my and he said, take this test, take this test. And back when I was a student, they didn't have the electronic scanners. You, you, you filled in the bubbles, but they had a piece of paper with little holes in it, and you covered up the paper with the holes. I just want to make sure. Cover, and then you could grade very quickly. You know, they have a piece of paper with the holes, and put it over them. So I took the test, and I really did not know what I was doing. I, I, I just, I had memorized the answers, so the teacher, uh, the principal graded my test. He used to teach algebra, and he was stunned. He was amazed. And uh, this is in one of the most uh, delicious moments of my life, my favorite part of my life. The, uh, if I'm ever depressed, I think about this. He looked at me and said, Frank, he goes, where did you learn algebra? And I looked at him and said, I don't know. It just came out. <laughs> and um, so I lied, but then immediately they thought, they thought this, this boy is a genius. That, uh, they said, we misdiagnosed him. Maybe when we put the node on his head, we reversed the polarity, and he is actually really smart. But the truth is, um, I didn't know algebra. I was just pretending. And so uh, the bad thing is, once you tell one lie, you have to tell more lies. And so the next day, they put me in the next math class, geometry. And the, to make a long, very long story short, I ended up getting a PhD and math from MIT because I couldn't stop. I had to keep on. And so the truth is, I don't really even like math that much. But I was, um, I was so driven to prove the experts wrong. And I'll tell you kind of a very funny story about this, is this doctor here that diagnosed me, I Googled him back. Uh, some, uh, I was giving a talk in Saratoga Springs, New York. He was practicing in Schenectady, New York, about 20 minutes away. And he, this was in uh, 2010 or so when I was talking there. He wrote the diagnosis in 1970, so 80, 90, 2000. 40 years later, I figured he got out of medical school, maybe he was 30 at the time, he gave my diagnosis. Then he was 70 years old when I gave the talk in New York. I wanted, before going to the airport to fly back, I wanted to confront him and say, Dr. Setukati, I am the boy that you said had neurological impairment. Yes. And tell him I went on to get a PhD in math from MIT and write a book and blah, blah, blah. But I got scared because someone told me, never make someone whose last name ends in a vowel mad. Because uh, a lot of mafia people will have uh, names that <laughs> end in the last vowel. So I was afraid if I confronted him, he would chop me up into pieces and hide me in his backyard. So that's kind of, but what's the, what's the whole point of this story? I, when I give talks, I always tell Teachers, I said, the tragedy is not that students fail to achieve all that they may dream. 
The tragedy is, is that students don't dream all that they may possibly achieve. So I talk to teachers, I always tell teachers, I said, when you go back to the classroom, remember that every student has untapped potential far beyond your or even their own uh, expectations. And so that's kind of the inspirational talk that I give to teachers. Usually I get my talk goes on a little bit longer. I did want to show, I, I, I made a, a vow to myself that if I ever achieved any sort of success in life, I would make it my life's mission and passion to <coughs> preach the message that each and every child has tremendous potential beyond uh, their, uh, uh, their parents, their teachers, or even their own expectations. And I had that opportunity. I met a fellow named John Saxon as a young high school student. That's here in Norman, Oklahoma. He passed away in 1996. When I got my PhD, he asked me, he said, Frank, would you like to come back to my, uh, come back to Oklahoma and run my company? And when I started with him, I was making just $3.25 an hour, helping him out. He was a teacher at what was then called Oscar Rose Junior College. Uh, he was a, 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 a army veteran of 30 years, fought in Vietnam and Korea. He was teaching at a junior college, and I was a student helper of his. And, I, and then what happened was, over time, his company grew a little bit. Before I got my PhD, he said, Frank, why don't you come back and run my company? And I said, Mr. Saxon, I don't know how to run a company. I've never even run a lemonade stand. And he said, that's okay, just fake it. Pretend like you know what you're doing, and you'll do just fine. And so I did that, and he died in 1996. I grew the company to about um, 100 million in annual sales and 250 employees. I was very blessed in my life. This is the company headquarters uh, right here on Route 9. If you go Route 9, heading east, there's the Postal Training Center, the National Center for Employee Development. To the south of that is our 160-acre campus. Now it's been sold to the Chickasaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation, but um, uh, the, uh, we had 250 employees, and in the original plans, if you look at the city, the original plans has John Saxon Boulevard off of Route 9, and then a cul-de-sac, uh, a little road leading nowhere, that's a cul-de-sac called the Wong Way. So they were <laughs> going to name that after the Wong Way. So um, I ended up in uh, early 2000, one of my bucket list items, bucket list means that you know something you want to accomplish before you die, was to appear in the Wall Street Journal, that's uh, America's newspaper of record, um, so if you achieve something, they say you've achieved something in, uh, in business if you appear in the Wall Street Journal with that picture. So after this happened, I submitted my letter of resignation to the, my board of directors. I was very well paid, and I said, you know, I want to pursue my passion for teaching, and the, the board was very nice. They said, could you stay around until we can hire a, a replacement for you for a successor? So that took about a year, and so I ended up uh, leaving my job in uh, 2003. At the time, I was born in 1964, so I think I was like 39 at the time. And then I went to teach at the Oklahoma School of Science and Math. I called up the Oklahoma School of Science and Math, and I said, I would like to teach there. And the head of the school said, I would love to have you here. You have good credentials with a PhD in math from MIT. But she said, I don't have any money to pay you. So I said, that's OK. I'll teach for free. So I taught there for three years in 2003, four, and five for no pay. So uh, that's kind of my story here. I was formerly chairman of Saxon Publishers, and this is, I don't mean any uh, disrespect to Chairman Mao, but this is what the, I did not do this, the employees put this on my door, and so I was the chairman of the company, and the bad thing is, is the, the young people's understanding of history is so small, they uh, didn't know why this was funny. So some of the twice that they said, we don't, we don't get it. I tried to explain that I don't belong in that picture, and this is a joke. So. Um, Anyhow, this is my, my former math teacher was, uh, uh, was the, one of the founding trustees of the Oklahoma School of Science and Math. And when I, got here, the, uh, when, when I got here, the state contacted me and said, Dr. Wong, they said, we have some good news and bad news for you. The good news is you deserve a raise because we're paying you below the bottom of your range. Every job has a range. But they said, the bad news is we have no money to pay your raise, so you can take it from your existing budget. And I said, no, I can't do that because 70% of our budget is personnel, I would have to cut someone's pay to get the raise. Like, I'd have to tell a full-time uh, custodian, maintenance worker, that I was going to cut them to part-time so I'd get the raise. So I said, no. And they said, well, legally, we have to pay you the bottom of your raise. So I had to work through the Attorney General's office to do that. They, 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 they put a, a big front-page piece about that because most of the agency heads that were told that um, they could get a raise, they had, were calling the Attorney General's office to figure out a legal way uh, to get the raise. So. So I just want to share with you kind of my personal philosophy and guiding principles. One is the, the lead one 
the Bible, Luke chapter 12, verse 38, to whom much is given, much is required. So I, I, I live a life of uh, service and giving back. I've been very blessed. When I left Saxon, I saved up enough money to basically retire, not like a king, but I could kind of coast a little bit. Uh, the Rotary Act, uh, Act of the Rotary Club, Service Above Self, and last, the State of Oklahoma motto, Labor, Labor, Omnia, Winkin, which means labor conquers all. What do I want to talk about here in terms of uh, moving into my discussion about growing up as a Chinese American and about uh, how do um, the Western culture and Eastern culture views academic achievement? I see that there's a kind of a fundamental cultural difference in Eastern cultures, uh, very generally, um, we, they largely see young people, or at least they tell young people that the belief is, is that everyone has largely the same innate ability, but that achievement, that almost any achievement is possible through hard work. And so that, um, uh, I think the, the, when I was growing up, there's a very strong feeling that there's certain things that you need to study, whether you like it or not, or whether you have ability or not, it tends to be the STEM areas, math, and, uh, science and so forth. In Western culture, the belief is that children have different innate abilities and interests, and the parent's job is really to uncover that, to nurture that, uh, and to help the students develop that in any way that, uh, that they can. So I'm going to show you some video clips. It may be a little bit painful to watch. It kind of illustrates this. Uh, this is from a movie called I Am Not Stupid. This is from a movie called I Am Not Stupid. And so it shows an example of a mother working with the child in math, and you can see uh, when he doesn't um, understand, uh, she starts beating him. And then the husband, who works for an American company, a Western company, and has a somewhat different view, comes in and interrupts and says he may be working to the maximum of his ability. This is a Singaporean movie. Yeah, this. This is a So anyhow, it kind of uh, shows the emphasis on, uh, you know, they have to be good in, uh, in math, otherwise he cannot succeed in um, Singaporean society. You know, I think the basic uh, feeling that through hard work you can have achievement is a very good one.